I have to tell you, I'm, I almost feel like crying because I come from a county where 97% um, are unchurched in California, and there are more people in this room right now than there are in the biggest church in our county. And to hear you all singing is amazing, amazing. So if you want to be a missionary, come to California. <clears throat> I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were, uh, my father was a police officer, my mother was a nurse. And they, um, they believed that they needed to be in jobs that served the community. And they went to church, and they took my brother, and they took me, because they wanted to go. <laughs> I didn't understand a lot of it. They sent me to uh, Christian church camps. Um, I went to the youth groups. And it, I was busy watching what was going on, and not so much listening to the message. And there were a lot of um, splits in the church. There was a lot of dysfunction going on. So that when, when I became a college student, I went away to college to University of Nevada, Reno. I mean, a real Christian area there. Um, and it was in the middle of the 60s. And I bought into everything that was going on. I bought into the women's liberation movement. I bought into free love. I tried, you know, smoking and drinking and the whole bit. And my life just kept spiraling down. Um, the final, I think, crisis for me was getting pregnant, crisis pregnancy, and ending up in a trailer out in the middle of the desert having an abortion. Uh, and I remember waiting at the end of the road for a couple friends from college who came and picked me up, and they were bringing me back to uh, Reno. And they just looked at me and they First of all, they thought, you know, should we take you to a hospital? And I said, no. I didn't care if I bled out at that point. And um, they said, are you okay? And I said, I'm fine. And I thought, I'm saying I'm fine, but I don't think I'm ever going to be fine again. Because I had enough knowledge, I thought, about God that I figured I'd just done the sin that was going to destine me for hell no matter what I did. So I went back to school and I, did, I thought a lot about suicide at that point. Um, but I just started putting one foot in front of the other and studying my classes and um, trying to concentrate. My brother was in the army at the time and he was stationed in Way as uh, he was in intelligence. And in 67, 68, there was the Tet Offensive. I don't know whether you guys you guys won't remember it, obviously. You weren't even born yet. Um, but the city was overrun by the North Vietnamese Army, and the building that he was in was bombed. And we didn't know whether he was alive or dead. Uh, he was taken captive. So we didn't hear anything for 10 days, two weeks. Um, and then the Marines, the US Marines, came back in and took the city. And it, came, it had come out in the hometown paper um, I didn't know about it because I was still in Reno, but that he had been captured. And then when they did find him badly wounded, uh, he was able to escape in the confusion of what was happening in the city. They um, put out another article in the paper about him being found. And those stories were sent to a friend of mine that I'd known since fifth grade, very good friend all through high school, who was serving as a Marine in Da Nang at the time, Rick Rivers, my future husband. So. Um, he came home December 20th, 1968. We saw each other December 21st, 1968. A year later, uh, December 21st, we were married. And I had all this baggage of what I had done in college, the things that I'd gone through. And he had all this baggage from Vietnam, because when he came home and walked through the airport, people were spitting on him and calling him a baby killer. And it was not a popular war at the time, and he had seen 21 of his friends killed over there. So he had a lot of the, the post-traumatic stress, and I didn't know at the time that I was also suffering from the same thing for different reasons. Um, so we had enough baggage between the two of us to sink the Titanic. Um, but we also were very stubborn, uh, not willing to give up, and it, it's sort of like, a, I like to think of the hawk and the devil, and neither one of us were the dove. We were both kind of clawing it out. It was a very roller coaster relationship in those early days. So we waited 
We didn't want to have a family because the world was such a rotten place. Why would you ever want to have children and bring them into this world? And he went back to college. Uh, he had gone to one year at USF before he joined the Marine Corps. So he, we wanted to have him go back there, but he, we couldn't afford it. It was $3,000 a semester to go there for tuition. So he ended up at the JC. Lots of political uh, protesting there. They, didn't, uh, they weren't very friendly to him as a veteran, an ex-Marine, um, burning flags. So it was very hard for him. He ended up finishing two years at the JC Dean's List, and then he transferred to UC Berkeley, which was even more interesting as an ex-Marine and a Vietnam veteran. Um, I went back, I went to work. I'd graduated from college. And I want to back up a little bit because I tend to do this as a novelist. I have an editor over there that can tell you they had to cut 40,000 words out of the last novel. <laughs> so. It's like, you know, I, I tend to kind of go off on these rabbit trails, but to back up a little bit, I always have known I wanted to be a writer. But I didn't know what I wanted to write because I hated to read. So, <laughs> just, I would rather be out riding a bike, riding a horse, hiking, anything. I did not want to be sitting in a house and reading. Um, and when I went away to college, I majored in English with a literary writing emphasis and minored in journalism because I didn't know what I wanted to write. Um, and I didn't like what they were assigning for reading. I didn't like the classics. I'm sorry. I'm, there probably is a teacher in here that's not very happy with me right now. Um, and it, after Rick and I married, he, he's from a reading family. They do all kinds of reading. And my mother-in-law started passing me westerns, romances, gothics. And I thought, oh, these are fun. The only, the only reading my parents did were how-to books because they built their own house from the ground up, foundations up. I don't remember them ever reading the Bible, which is interesting. Um, and so I started reading these books, and then I, I thought, this is fun. So I laid out what I, the genres that I liked. I didn't know this was against the rules at the time, but I wrote a Western Gothic romance, just combined the genres together. And that's how I got started, uh, really became kind of hooked on it. Um, so I'm working as a, first as a, that's the other thing, don't major in English. Because I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be getting in trouble, I'm sure. Um, I, worked, I had a degree in English, and I worked as a PBX operator, which is the old style plug in the cord, you know, with the headphone on. Yeah, that's how old I am. Um, and then I worked as a secretary. I had been a stewardess for a very brief time, international stewardess, when I first got out of college. Uh, there weren't a lot of jobs. I worked for men who had less education than I did, but at the time there wasn't, you know, equal rights for women. I still have a little bit of that women's live in me, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, we, uh, we decided to start our family. We waited six years, and the first pregnancy uh, it was very stressful, and at that time I was working as a substitute substitute teacher for inner city Oakland. And if any of you have ever heard of Oakland, the murder capital of California, that's where I was in the ghetto. Um, and it was stressful work. Um, and the doctor said, you really need to stay home. So I stayed home and that's when I wrote my first novel. It gave me something to do, it was a lot of fun. Um, but I lost that baby. And I kept thinking, God is taking from me what I took from him and it's justice. But for Rick, it was, why would God kill my child for something that you did? So it was a very confusing, emotional time. We had our uh, first son in Oakland, and then Rick was offered a job in Southern California. We moved down there, and that's when I began my full-time writing career in the steamy historical romance genre for the general market. Um, and I was building a career, and he was working for an aviation overhaul company. Uh, and we, we started attending churches. We moved three different times, and the church that we went to, Jesus had left the building. I, I don't know any other way to say it. 
Um, and we didn't know it, we didn't miss him because we didn't really know him. So Rick became chairman of the board of trustees and they didn't know he wasn't a Christian and we didn't know he wasn't a Christian because we had no clue what a Christian was. Um, but he saw the inner workings of that church and it impacted him greatly so that eventually, um, I'll get to that later. <laughs> um, we went out for a walk because I was really into the writing now. It was a good way to escape from the things that were going on because we got pregnant again and I lost another baby. And we had a daughter, I lost another baby. We had a son. Um, so that whole issue of the abortion in my past kept coming up over and over again and believing that God just hated me. Um, and we went out for a walk one day and Rick was saying, if you had a choice between me and the children and your writing, you'd take your writing. And it, it really, um, it was a hurtful thing, but it was true. Because I thought, I had this idea that, well, I could pack up my typewriter, it's using a typewriter, then not a computer, <laughs> um, and go off into the woods and be very happy in a cabin. Because as a fiction writer, if I wanted to kill somebody, I couldn't get away with it. I could do anything I wanted in fiction, and it, it was no problem. But it really shook me up that my priorities were so backwards. So we decided that we needed to make some changes in our life, because our marriage was really uh, crumbling at this point, uh, with his issues and my issues to combined together. And so we decided the way to do that is to sell your house, give away, we had like a 3,000 square foot house in um, Southern California, and we decided to sell it I moved into a rental home so the kids could finish their uh, year in school, and Rick moved north. We gave away about half of our possessions, and he started a family business. I mean, nothing, all these outside changes. And then he started looking for a home to rent in Northern California. And as it happened, the only home available just happened to be between two Christian families. So when we're moving up there on the hottest day in 10 years, it was 106 degrees and we're moving into this little tiny house. Maybe that's not so hot here in Nashville, I don't know. <laughs> it's hot in California. Um, we're moving in and we're kind of not real happy with each other. We have three small children. We're trying to unpack all this stuff. And here comes this little eight-year-old boy from next door you know, can I help you move in? Can I help you move in? No, just go away and leave us alone. <laughs> the last thing we need is to have a neighbor kid over here. So he, he persisted. So finally, I think Rick gave him some clothes to carry in or boxes of shoes or something. And he's saying, have I got a church for you? And at this point in time, Rick wanted nothing to do with the church because he'd been working in that church in Southern California where Jesus had left the building. Um, and I was desperate enough, oh, on the other side, there was another family, and the lady made great apple pie, and she brought that over and said, have I got a church for you? One, they went to the same church. Now, how does that happen? <laughs> Just coincidence, right? Um, a couple weeks later, I was desperate enough to try anything, and so I went to that church, and when I came in, I felt like I'd come home, because it was the first time in my life I'd heard expository preaching. I mean, these people were really different. They were really weird. They were carrying Bibles, and they were actually reading them. It was amazing. Um, so I started going back. I think he was teaching Ephesians, starting chapter 1, verse 1, going straight through the historical context, what the scriptures say, um, and then most of all, how it, how it pertains to your life today. And so I was just eating this up and came home and asked Rick to go with me, and nope, I've, I'm going to wash the car, I'm going to mow the lawn, I'm going to do anything, but I'm not going to church again. And he had not been raised in the church, so he had no, no way of knowing. Um, so being devious and stubborn, I went to the pastor and I said, would you be interested in teaching a home Bible study? Because if, <laughs> if you can't get your husband to church, you bring the church to your husband. And the pastor said, if you can get your husband to agree to it, sure. And Rick said, fine, go ahead. 
And I, I knew he would like Rick. Now, Rick Hahn was the pastor, and Rick, my husband, are now best friends. But he came into our home, and he started the Bible study, which is still going on today in our home, only now Rick is teaching. My Rick, not Rick Hahn. Um, and we were going through the, the Gospels. We were going through topical studies. We were um, doing all kinds of things. And we, it was at this time that we decided that we needed to be baptized. So Rick and I were baptized together on May 6, 1986. And I thought, you know, all of a sudden, I'm a Christian and I understand what it is, that I'm saved by grace. And I thought, everything's gonna be great. And it was horrible. <laughs> I couldn't write anymore. It was like God just said, okay, you're done with that. And that was the place where I had, I felt like I had an identity. I'd sold probably four or five million books at that point. I had a career in the general market. Um, and I didn't understand what was going on. I just couldn't make any sense out of anything that I tried to write. And I ended up starting to study the Bible. I worked with Rick in the family business, and it took about three years until I, I was in love with Jesus. I didn't care if I ever wrote again. I didn't miss it at all. And then we came to the Minor Prophets. And when we came to the book of Hosea, it broke my heart. Um, and that resulted in redeeming love. I felt like God was saying to me, you know, you've been writing these steamy historical romances for you know, the last number of years, but this is the love story I want you to write. It's about my love for each individual person, but also my love for my people. Um, and it was probably the most incredible year I've had as a writer because I felt like Jesus was just sitting right there telling me his story and telling me how much he loved me. Um, and after, the, after that, I thought, well, I guess that's it. You know, one book, and I'm kind of making a statement of faith because I was getting letters from people, why aren't you writing anymore? And it was a chance when people would write to me and say, I wish I could meet a Michael Hosea who happens to, he's the, the hero of the story. Um, and he's really um, and it, like Jesus. He loves Angel, the prostitute, like Jesus loves each one of us. And I would get letters from people and I could write back and say, well, if you're looking for a Michael Hosea, you can find one in Jesus. That's where to go for Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright is Jesus. But um, it didn't end there. I thought that was it. But what came to me is I have all kinds of questions. I mean, I still have a lot of questions. I'll probably have questions until the day I die. Um, and God was kind of leading me to take those questions to him and use the different, you know, create characters that voice all the different opinions about those particular questions. And the first one I had was, how do I share my faith with unsafe family and friends who don't want to hear about Jesus and only use his name in a curse, and they would not pick up the Bible? And what I learned, in, out of that uh, question came a voice in the wind in a character called Hadassah. And uh, what I learned is, it's not what you say, it's how you live, because people are watching you especially in Sonoma County, when we're, there are only 3% of us. Um, they watch how we live. And then there is a time when the question will arise and they'll ask you, why do you believe what you believe? Um, I had other questions like, um, how do you deal with anger? Um, how many times do you forgive people that have hurt you? And each of the books that I've done, I don't know how much time I've used up. I don't want to use all of your class time up. Um, each, each of the books has been started with a question that I have in my own faith walk. And then I go to scripture and I create the story. Um, and in the process, I'm receiving the answer from God. And I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. And sometimes it's very painful. The hardest book I ever had to write. Um, I did the I did the trilogy, the Mark of the Lion trilogy, and then I did a book called The Scarlet Thread, which had to do with sovereignty. Because I think Christians tend to throw around a lot of big words. What does sovereignty mean? What does justification mean? What does all this stuff mean? Um, ended up going on a a journey on the Oregon Trail with three other women from the church, and what I was seeing was question has always been there 
from the beginning of time of who's in control of my life. Am I going to be in control or is God going to be in control? And when I had turned my life over to Christ, I could look back from the time I was a child and I could see how he was always there. And there were people in my life that impacted me and really brought me to the Lord um, and, and were guiding me there. Um, so it, it, that scarlet thread is his presence in your life all the time. But the story that kept coming was... God kind of nudging me to write about my abortion experience, and I didn't want to go there. I'd go out for a long walk and just say, I don't, you've forgiven me. Why do you keep pestering me about this? Why do you keep bringing this up? You know, and I argued and argued, and then one day, um, one of my children came home from Christian school and said, every woman who ever had an abortion should be executed for murder. And I felt like I'd just been stabbed in the heart. And I thought, is that what you're learning in the Christian school? Because I don't think that's Jesus' attitude. Um, I think it has to do with grace when you, he's forgiven us and he restores your life. And then I went to my mother and I said, you know, I think I'm gonna need to write a book about abortion. I think that that's what God is leading me to uh, write about. And I thought it had to do with forgiveness. And she's sitting there and she's saying, well, I have something to tell you. Uh, she had tuberculosis before she married my dad, and when I was about three years old, she reactivated and was sick again, and she was pregnant. And the doctors and my father felt that she would not survive the pregnancy, so they took her in for a late-term abortion. And she was crying when she told me, and she said, you would have had a younger brother. And I was, I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, this is like 40 years later and she's still dealing with it, she's still crying. Um, and it explained a lot of different dynamics of things that happened over the years. And I thought, okay, I need to write it. But then I needed to sit down with each one of my children. My husband said, you know, you need to be warned that they may not feel the same about you when you tell them what you went through and what you did. And I thought, well, that's true, but I still have to speak the truth. And I sat down with each one of them and told them my story, and they, it changed some of their feelings about things, and it also, um, they said, go for it, you know, write the story. Rick was really concerned because he was more afraid about what the Christian community would do to me. <laughs> he thought I'd be stoned uh, or burned at the stake or something, and um, the issue for him was, can you just say that you did some research? And I said, but if, it, if people ask, I have to be able to state the truth. So I have to be able to go public. And as it turned out, when the Atonement Child came out, Tyndale um, sent, the, sent a copy right away. I was off speaking somewhere, and they, Rick got it, and he read it for the first time. He's always edited every book I've ever done. He did not edit that one. He didn't read that one until after it was printed. And he told me, he said, you need to go public, and I'm behind you 100%. Um, so that cleared the way. But I'm not going to go through every book I've written. I, don't, I know that would drive you all crazy. Um, but what I, what I want to say to you is life is hard. It really is hard. You, you are in a hothouse environment here. There's a lot of protection. The world is full of lies, it's full of temptations, and stay in your scriptures, study your Bible, put on the armor of God because you're going to need it when you get out there, and follow Jesus. Just keep following Jesus. And thanks for listening. <laughs>